please pronounce your name correctly for me? Katrin Alvarsdottir. All right. And you're in Iceland, grew up in Iceland, correct? Yep, that's correct. I'm always interested, like, how people get made. So, like, were your parents creative? Did you have great teachers that sort of took you down the creative path? Like, how did you sort of become who you are today? Well, I was born in Iceland, like I said, in an isolated town in West Fjords. It's called Isafjörður, which literally translates to Ice Fjord. And my parents were... They were very young when they had me and my two brothers. They exposed us to music and movies and popular culture. My mom was 20 when she had me, so they were very young. And I used to spend a lot of time with my grandmother. Maternal grandmother had a lot of influence on me, big influence. And she loved uh, poetry, theater, storytelling. She was also the first woman to be on the town council. And this was in the 1940s a mother of seven children, and she encouraged me to set up plays in her basement with my friends, and, you know, I had access to all her props in the house, all the dresses from my mom and her sisters. There were six sisters, so we would just do, like, dress-ups, role-playing, making skits in her house, and I would direct plays and things like that. So after that, when I was 11 years old, my family moved to Sweden, and it was in Finnspång, Sweden, that I started, to, I mean, was exposed to photography. It was in high school. I took a black and white darkroom class. And I was really fascinated by it, but I didn't think of it as a career move or something you could do as, as a, you know, as a living. And it might not be. And no, maybe. <laughs> not a good idea. But, you know, in retrospect, my friends kept talking about, like, how cool I would look as a press photographer like wearing a leather jacket and having a camera strap, you know, around the neck. But it wasn't something at the time that, you know, even pursued. But I've always been curious about other cultures and traveled a lot. And when we moved back to Iceland and I studied at the University of Iceland, I decided to study French language and literature. I previously had spent some time in France, like babysitting and learning the language, you know. So I was kind of obsessed with the French culture. and It wasn't like a long-term plan that it's just like, I want to learn the language and read the literature. And I wasn't thinking about exactly what I wanted to do at that point. But when I was about to finish my BA degree there at the university, I bought a 35 millimeter camera and enrolled in a vocational school, like a night class. And after that, there was like no turning back. The following year, I moved to the U.S., and started studying photography. I was 24, and I moved there with my then boyfriend, who later became, became my husband, and I enrolled into this program. This was before the internet. I mean, this is like 1988, so <laughs> there was no way of knowing what the schools were. We just had these the Fulbright library with some catalogs from American colleges and things, so just flipped through the catalogs. <laughs> guess, you know, who had the most interesting program just from the pictures. And I enrolled in this community college called Brevard Community College, and it's now called Eastern State University or Eastern State College. Yeah, it doesn't have the same name anymore. But this was a two-year program. And I was very lucky because at the time, the assistant professor was Roland Miller. He was such an inspiration to me and he was so passionate about photography and teaching and, and art and he was also very entertaining and funny so his classes were just amazing and Roland is he's kind of like space photographer he's recently published a book called interior space and they are like it's photographs from the international space station and before that, he was documenting the space launch facilities, both in Cape Canaveral and other places in the U.S. So he encouraged me a lot. And I was lucky to have him there because he would also, because mostly the people who were in the program were interested in uh, like practical things about photography. But he came from an art background. I think he has an MFA degree from yeah, some, I don't know if it was Chicago or one of those schools. So he had a different emphasis than the other teachers in the program. And he encouraged me to apply to art school after the two years. I ended up applying to the Art Institute of Boston, 
which was a small school in Kenmore Square. I was also lucky there with teachers because at the time, Christopher James was recently hired chair of photography. He came from Harvard. He'd been for many years at Harvard University. And this was his first year at the Art Institute. It was 1991. And I was really nervous of, you know, going to his first class because everybody was talking about, you know, about him coming from Harvard and being very tough. But his methods were like, he was so in the moment, but it's very fluid and but still like wanting to push you and, and challenge you. So it was very good for me. I mean, I was shy at the time, and but he believed in me and that gave me the courage to further explore my ideas. And then there were, I mean, there were a lot of good teachers at the time. This was early 90s. There was also Jane Tuckerman and Bonnell Robinson that were very supportive. But the art institute doesn't exist anymore. It's merged with Leslie University. But I believe Bonnell Robinson is still a professor at Leslie University. I think the other ones have retired. Yeah, lots of schools do that. My all, Let's see, I've got three degrees in two of the schools that I have both stopped being in existence. So like, I've got two degrees from two different schools that no longer exist. So ah, Yeah, yeah. It's kind of sad because I was, I think, 2000. I don't know, remember if it was 17, I went back to Boston. And, you know, it's different to go to like Leslie University than, you know, the old school and seeing people. It's just totally different feeling. Oh, okay. Well, if we want to go like that, I attended four schools and one of them it went from a college to a university. So it like, you know, quadrupled in size and all kinds of craziness. So that changed as well, rather dramatically. But you're now teaching, correct? I'm now teaching, yeah, part time. Not a lot, but, you know. Part time. Part time, yeah. Yeah. I've been teaching at three different schools in Iceland. Is Just as a question, because I always wonder this about people like, when you're talking about teaching, do you teach because you want to be a teacher or do you teach because it's a way to sort of make a living, you know, when you're in the arts? I think when I started teaching, it was a way to make a living. I think I started in 2007 at the University of the Arts. And then I've been teaching at three different schools, and they have all different emphasis. It's all photography classes, but it's different kind of, like, the level the students are at. And, you know, I also taught, like, darkroom classes to, like, at night, so that people would enroll, just anybody, you know, beginning classes. So I think for now what i like the most is when i'm teaching people who are really into it so they're like working on their final project and they're about to graduate and they're all in i think that's the most interesting for me now and that's what i've been doing for the last two years we all like that the most yeah <laughs> yeah so I don't know anybody that sits around going, you know what I really want to teach introductory level. Yeah. I mean, it's all right, but I think I'm over it by now. I don't, I don't want to repeat the same things anymore. <laughs> Done it so many times. I totally understand. Yeah. I'm, by the way, in case you didn't know, I'm a photographer and I'm also a professor. So like, I'm on the same boat. I got you. Okay. 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 Great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, I also like being, you know, with young people and see how they their outlook in life and i think that's important yeah i enjoy it but i would not do it full time yeah there is a bit of a luxury to doing it part-time because like you don't have to attend all the stupid meetings and be part of the committees and all the other stuff that's really the the stuff that sort of sucks the life out of you as a teacher as far as i'm concerned yeah yeah being, being part-time, you're kind of like a rock star. You like walk in, you do your class, and then you leave. Done. No responsibility. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. But it's still, you know, a certain responsibility because you want them to, like, you try to make the best of the situation and help them. So I get very, like, involved in this project. And I don't work a lot on my my artwork while I'm, like, in the middle of it. Of course, you know, I, I do exhibit and, and do things like that while I'm teaching, but it's like I never start a project or, you know, go deeply into a project because it's always in the fall, like it's the, the fall semester, start in September until end of December. So mostly I work on my projects from spring and summertime because I do 
photography mostly in Iceland. And, you know, we have a nicer weather then and it's easier to travel. And more daylight. And more daylight for sure. Yeah. Now, okay. So speaking about Iceland, you were associated with the Icelandic Photography Festival or Photo Festival. I'm not sure quite what the title is. What's your relationship? Did you, I sort of saw like you founded it, you're on the board of it. Like what's, what's that whole background? Yeah, I co-founded it with a fellow artist. His name is Pieter Thompson. And we had both worked with Reykjavik Photo Museum. They had a festival called Photography Days. And we, from the beginning, we were involved in that festival. It was in 2012 it started. And then other museums joined. And in 2016, we decided to found our own festival in collaboration with both Photo Museum. And we have two, uh, that's what's so confusing to people, that Iceland has two photography museums. One run by the city, and it's called the Reykjavik Photo Museum. And then there's another one that's a state-run museum called the Icelandic Photo Museum. So we're, both, we're working with both of those museums. Okay. So one's like local government, one's federal government. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So festival is kind of like an umbrella organization. So it's we have a board and basically we search, I mean, we send out to museum directors and, and curators, you know, year, two years in advance before the next edition. Like if they want to be a part of the program and what kind of exhibitions they're working on. So we like collaborate with all these, but we don't, the board doesn't decide what kind of exhibitions are going to be in each museum or each gallery. It's more up to them to decide, but we have a website and make posters and promote the festival and also give advice or guide them if they ask us to. But it's it's more like getting everybody together as a team. And we also have this portfolio review. It's an international event. And that's financed by the Reykjavik Photo Museum. We help them organize it, but they pay for the lights and hotels and, and people pay so, I mean, it's not very expensive because it's artists, so we, we try to keep the, the cost, you know, what people have to pay to a minimum. And it's been running, for, yes, for 10 years. And the next edition is going scheduled for Jan. It's always in January. So it's uh, January 2022. And we decided to have it in January because there's so many art festivals in Iceland. There's so many events. It's uh, such a creative <laughs> place so there's always something going on but there was not much going on in the middle of january when we decided this and also a lot of people haven't been here for that i mean they come in summer and spring so it was interesting to bring people into the darkness of the winter and see the nordic lights from the balcony of your hotel and it's not as cold as people think because we don't have minus 30 degrees celsius like finland does it's pretty mild. The winter is pretty mild and we don't have a lot of snow in the capital, but we have snow up north and other places, but it's pretty mild here, actually. I think that's pretty relative. I used to live in the United Arab Emirates, so I'm going to go with all relative. Exactly. Yeah, of course it's relative. But I think people are imagining that this is more like, you know, in the winter, more like I mean, the coldest I've experienced was Boston, like February in Boston. It was the coldest weather I've experienced. And I lived as a kid in Sweden, and we had a snow and cold weather. But the wind in Boston, like the wind chill factor, was crazy. <laughs> yeah, my coldest was Iowa. It was so cold. Three feet, well, let's say three feet, so one meter of snow. And the wind chill is what really killed it. I mean, it just made it, it was... In Fahrenheit, it was like negative 30, so 60 degrees below freezing. Wow. Yeah, it was insane. I mean, it only lasted like one day, but still, that was cold. <laughs> but I still made it to class, just so you know. Okay. <laughs> I showed up for class, and the teacher called in and said, I can't come in due to the weather, but I was there. Wow, okay. Did, did you walk in that weather? 
I did. Yeah. I literally put on every article of winter clothing I owned to do it. And there was not a car on the street. I mean, it, it, I could walk down the middle of the street. It was really quite fun in some ways. It was very sort of post-apocalyptic kind of thing. It was, it was it, an experience for sure. So the photo festival. So like why? Okay. So like I'm trying to think through your life from what I know about you already. So you're a practicing artist. You teach part-time. You run a photo festival. What else do you do? Because I think there, there's some other things in there that you're pulling off to make a living out of this. Yeah, I also curate photography exhibitions, so, and that also happened kind of by uh, chance that I started to curate. It was actually, so just to go back, um, when I moved back to Iceland, having been away for 16 years in 2004, I didn't know anybody here. I had no contacts. And maybe a couple of people, you know, very few people, but but not like you know, the people who went to school in Iceland and had the professors and their, you know, classmates and opening galleries with them or things like that. So it was pretty start from scratch. And I had a friend of my husband's knew about this job at the National Gallery, which is basically where the Icelandic Photo Museum is. It's the National Gallery and like a department under that is the Photo Museum. And they were looking for a photographer to document, like for studio work, to document their, because they were opening a new exhibition and they wanted three photographers to be in the studio and photograph every single object that was going to be in the exhibition. And these are like really ancient objects and really precious things. So you had to have like a conservator there, like putting the object in place and standing there and checking the light and the temperature and all that. And this was like, I don't know, a couple of months after I moved back from New York to Iceland in 2004. So I get this job and from there I get to know people in the museum and of course in Iceland who have to, you know, to do with photography and art and all that. And other photographers who were working at the museum and in this project. And that led to us founding this association called Association of Icelandic Contemporary Photographers. And we founded that in 2007 and had a group show at the National Museum, which was like the Icelandic Photo Museum. And they published a, a book with interviews and texts about we were eight photographers. And we all came from different backgrounds. A lot of them had studied because the system in Iceland is like, you can't really take MFA or BFA in photography. There's no program like that. So you have to go either to Europe or the US. That's very surprising because Iceland has a very strong photography scene. Yeah, yeah. But most of them are educated elsewhere. Interesting. Mm hmm Okay, wait, within within that, I'm wondering, okay, so I'm also an expat, you know, raised in America, now living elsewhere. I've always, I always wonder, like, so for you, from your experiences, having been somewhere and then gone somewhere else to be educated and then to return home, was that beneficial for you? Because, like, I always look back at my friends. I've still got friends that literally still live in this like the same house they grew up in kind of thing or like they still live in the same city they grew up in and personally i sort of look at them like i feel that sad <laughs> but i yeah different people have different perspectives they may be very happy and they may think i'm sad whatever but i'm just wondering like so professionally i guess is sort of the big question like did leaving your home and then returning to your home at a, at a later time was that beneficial or did that somehow like detriment? Because you talked about how some people had known people since they grew up and they had the same teachers and all this kind of stuff. So like were there pros and cons to that? Yeah, I think there was a lot of pros to that. I mean, I think it for me, it was perfect. You know, I don't know what would have happened had I stayed in Iceland this whole time because just by moving to Sweden when I was 11 changed everything, you know, because I was in a small town. And even though my family had moved from that town to Reykjavik and we lived there for three years prior to moving to Sweden, it's still Reykjavik at the time was a small town. So that exposed me to, I mean, a lot of different things. And also, I mean, living away from Iceland for 16 years, I think when I came back, I was like a foreigner, you know, I didn't really understand what was going on. <laughs> I'm talking like the politics or like the local humor or like what was going on in the society, like all that stuff. It took me a while to get into because I was a child. I mean, even though I left when I was 24, I was, it was a big gap where I also didn't 
grew up in Iceland as a child. So yeah, I think in my professional like life, I think I view Iceland like in a different way. My first project, my first book that was published in 2005 is a project that I did in Iceland. And this was when I was living in New York. And I would, you know, go back and forth to the photograph. And this was something I photographed with a Holga plastic camera. And it was abandoned places in Iceland, like man-made structures. And I did this for maybe three or four years. And it was a collection of these black and white images. And then I collaborated with a friend who was a musician. And he went to the same locations. He did recordings and made these soundscapes to go with the photographs. And when the book was published, it was actually published by a record company, a record shop, a really well-known record shop in Iceland called Tolt Toner, which means 12 tones. And they published it. And that work was shown in so many places in the US because at the time I was living in New York when I was making it, I applied to a lot of open calls, group shows, things like that. And it always got accepted and I got some like prizes and also I had a solo show a place in the East Village called the Seventh and Second Gallery. You know, this really small place. And, you know, I somehow opened a lot of opportunities for me to have this project that I did in Iceland. And also I probably, I don't know if I would have done that project had I lived in Iceland this whole time. Okay, I have a really stupid, because I'm also a photographer and I love Holga cameras, why did you choose a Holga over, like, let's say, a Diana or doing it with a pinhole or some other thing? Like, I'm a fan of Holgas. I own three of them myself. So I'm on your side. But why? Why did you choose it? Actually, it was a Diana camera. Ah. Holga is just like my, an overall term of all of them. I think, yes. Yeah, it was a Diana camera. And I bought it in at this yard sale in Maine while I was living, you know, in Boston as a student. And the reason I bought it was that my professor, Christopher James, he used Holga, Diana cameras, a lot of those plastic cameras, a lot for his work. And he introduced us to that in his class. So that's why I bought it. And I never really got into it at the time. It wasn't until like much later when I worked on this project. It was the first project that I did with the Holga or Diana camera. I love the plastic cameras because I mean, especially these, even these days, well, even these days, Photography has become such a beautiful, polished thing that it's nice to have that random, unknown nature to it. The, the things that, like, everything is so controlled and contrived, you know, between Lightroom and Photoshop and all the other things that it's nice to have a little, I'm not sure what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, I think I just like the dreamlike, you know, quality and still having medium format film and I had been shooting with Neopan 400 for years for 35 millimeter was my favorite Fuji film at the time so I, I kept using that and I just for this project it just did work for me and then I used it for several other projects and I still use it today but not much but a little bit okay wait do you still shoot with film just occasionally with not a Diana this day I think it's getting too old but I bought some new Holga cameras that I occasionally use and scan the film then. But I mostly, in 99%, it's digital. I know. I want to get back to, to film. I really enjoy film. Yeah, yeah. It's complicated. It's too damn expensive. Yeah, because you have to rely on other people too. Oh, yeah, especially if you're doing color, yes. Develop it and all that stuff. Yeah, I would know. It's funny. In my mind, if I thought about doing film, I would think about doing black and white. I would never think about doing color. I don't know why. Yeah, yeah. I mostly do color. I mean, this project was all black and white, but in general, I mostly do color. Something else I saw, you have a lot, you, well, okay, I'm not a lot, but you have a number of books that you've produced. I'm fascinated. I've Sadly, in my career, I've never gotten a book produced. Still a dream of mine. How did you get that? So you talked about the first one actually but i said like then how did you get the rest of them published and i don't mean like artistically and creatively i mean sort of like nuts and bolts like how did you meet a publisher how did you get the did you submit proposals did somebody come to you like how did it actually come about mm -hmm. i mean for my first book i sent it all over 
and in Iceland nobody liked it. They thought it was really ugly, out of focus, because Iceland is so beautiful. Why would you take pictures of all these old abandoned, you know, things that were really like rotting down? So I didn't get positive feedback at all for the first one, but the second one, which is called Equivocal, I worked on it for three years, I think. I had two exhibitions. I was at the time with this gallery called Gallery August. And we had a solo show there for the Reykjavik Art Festival in 2010. And it was a reporter from Art in America who came to my exhibition and wrote about it. And it got some publicity there. So I think because Iceland is so small that the publishers kind of knew, had seen the work, knew a little bit about it before I you know, sent it to them. But I somehow ended up sending it to, I think, think it was a recommendation through you know, friends who recommended that I talk to this publisher who was focusing on art, visual arts, making these really nice, exclusive kind of editions and high quality printing and, you know, very beautiful presentations. So I contacted them and I think it was just a, like a one meeting and then the publisher said, yeah, I like the work. I want to publish it. It was just like something that, you know, I didn't expect it at all. But it was a problem in funding it. Funding is always a problem. So I had to apply for a lot of grants. And yeah, I mean, it's complicated. It took from that first meeting until it was published. It took a long time. And this was, had an exhibition in Germany and Frankfurt. And at this time, Iceland was the hosting nation of the book fair, international book fair in Frankfurt. And they had set up exhibitions with Icelandic artists at the same time. And I got some small, I think, grant from there. And then just tried everything, you know, and then used some of my own money from other jobs in the end, you know, because it's expensive. Printing and all that stuff is very expensive. So it took time, but it was published in 2012. And how did the sales go? Because I... I have tons of friends who've produced books, quote unquote, produced books over their career, who have boxes and boxes of them in their garage that never sold. Yeah. I mean, of course, distribution is the tricky part. And being in Iceland, there's a very limited people who are interested in these kinds of, of books. So, I mean, it's not even possible to make any money out of it. Even though you sell the whole edition of, I don't know, 700 books, you will never make any money. But I knew that. But what happened at the time was that I had an exhibition in New York. It was a festival that my friends were running in, in Dumbo, I think. And since I had an exhibition there, when the book was published, I contacted, this is also through friends, there's the biggest, I mean, distributor, I think, in the world, DIP, which is the art book distributor. They were interested in the book because I, at the same time, had an exhibition in New York. And the guy who is very involved at the company and sets up, I mean, he's on the floor setting up the bookshops and organizing everything, and everybody knows him. He's Icelandic, and his name is Skuta. And his wife owns the company. And I'm not sure what his title is, but he's kind of like, does pretty much everything there. But of course, he's not working in the marketing department and my publisher had to send them the marketing department, all the stuff. And, and you know, they had to agree on everything. But because Scooter liked the work, he put up my book. He installed it in the PS1 MoMA bookstore while the festival was happening that year. So it got distributed all over. I mean, it was on everywhere. I mean, Asia, US, Europe. So I got it really lucky that way. But I think it's just timing also, you know, when what's happening in your career, if the book is relevant to, you know, if you had I not had this happening in New York, they probably would not have wanted the book in New York at the time. It's timing, it's relevance. It's also like you're saying, and a lot of your stories are a friend of mine, a friend of mine. And like, it's, that's one of the things that a lot of people in the arts don't really understand is they think sadly they think that merit so like making quality work is the point of it but 
that's just a point of being in the arts industry. It's also it, a lot of it's also about sort of building that tribe, building that community, because without that community of people and those friends to help you with these little little introductions and stuff, you're not going to be as successful as you might hope you would. Yeah, like me. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot about. I mean, of course, you have to make the work. <laughs> I mean, you have to make the work, and for years, you know, I was just making the work and didn't know anybody. But it's important to get to know people, and like that organization I was telling you about, the Contemporary Photography Association. Through that, I met people, and then I was also on the board of the Visual Arts Association in Iceland, and that's how I got to know a lot of visual artists. And I was there for years on that board, and then. That led me to the Icelandic Art Center. I was on their board also for many years. Now I'm on one of the museum's advisory boards. I mean, that's very important as well, all that networking thing. You know? Okay, wait, I have a question because this has come up numerous times in conversations. Associations. I'm not perfectly clear being a non-Scandinavian slash non-Icelandic person, exactly what an association is does what's its role like this kind of stuff like i don't even i get the concept of it but like what do they actually do because they seem to be incredibly important not just even in iceland and scandinavia but in europe as well i hear the term association thrown around a lot mm -hmm. so this is like a collective way of getting your things made or, or you know happening like Contemporary Photography Association, our plan was to get photography accepted side by side with other artwork in the museums, in the public museums. Because I, you know, when I moved back from uh, New York in 2004, Iceland did not consider photography an art form. It was not accepted, even though it was, this is not that long ago. I mean, of course, there was a lot of photography, but there was photography made by artists or photography that had like photographers making, taking the photographs for other artists. That was fine. But if you had a photography background, like myself, you're just a photographer, you're not an artist. So there was no way to get your foot in the door. The only way you could exhibit was in the photo museums. So our goal was to change that and also to influence the publishing in Iceland because like to create a dialogue in Icelandic about contemporary photography, which uh, there was very little written about it at the time. So we just will have a board and we work together on making applications and trying to talk to curators and theorists and get people involved and get some you know, funding and start projects, get more exposures as a group. Okay, so these associations, like in my mind, in my stupid, naive mind, I picture like when I heard the term association, I think like camera clubs in America, which are really just sort of a group of people coming together, like-minded, whatever, that just sort of appreciate in case of a camera club, it would just be, you know, they like the thing. But it sounds to me like these associations have a purpose or a mission or an intention versus just being sort of uh, just, you know, uh, enjoying each other's company and, and talking about the things you love kind of thing. But they sort of cameras. <laughs> yeah, basically. So, but these associations seem to like want to have to make some change in the world versus just congratulate each other for making good work. Yeah, they want to have influence. And on, like, you know, local politicians, like how the grants are distributed, you know, all these things. But, I mean, of course, we have camera clubs and things like that as well. But these associations are, like, I mean, it's like a mutual goal that we work together. And everybody in, like, there were eight people who founded it, and everybody had somebody that they knew they could bring to the table. Like, you know, I know so-and-so who is, I don't know, a curator, and I will talk to him and see if he wants to curate an exhibition. With, and then he has connections to a museum, and he has to pitch to the museum, and, you know, things like that. So it's easier. And now it's like 43 members or something like that. I'm not sure how many, but it's easier than just by your own trying to get anywhere. Of course, it's easier as a group and to have the support and a mutual goal. It sounds fabulous. I wish these things existed more because that's one of the things that always bothered me about 
you know, I'm sorry if I'm harping on camera clubs, but this is the easiest association I can come up with. But like camera clubs, they're, they were just like, just mutual appreciation. Like, hey, you do good work. I do good work. That's nice. Good job. But it, the idea of an association where it has a, a mission, a goal, a, a, a thing they're trying to accomplish to change something, that sounds inc- much more productive and helpful to the entire community than a camera club. Yeah, it's just a different thing. Yeah. Yeah. So that association helped in making, I mean, what we were talking about before about all these connections and you know, networks and things of getting like your voice heard elsewhere, not just in the photography community. There's also something else that I noticed on in your, one of your books is Econ Award, Icon Award. What, what is that award? This is something just done once, and it was on the anniversary of the Icon magazine. It's a magazine in Vienna, and they decided to, I think it was was a 25-year-old anniversary, I'm not sure, something around that 25 years it had been published, and they decided to make this award for women over 45, and it was, in particular, they thought about it as you know, women often start as artists and then they have children and family and then it's difficult for them to continue. And then when they are on a roll again, they are too old for anything, to apply for anything. Or, or, you know, they're just looked over. So they wanted to emphasize that, you know, age group, women, 45 plus. And three winners got published in the magazine. They made three covers with each from, work from each person and they had really elaborate articles about our work. And then they had an award ceremony and, and I went to Vienna for that. That was in November of 17 or something. And then, like, not the magazine, but another organization in Vienna was interested in an exhibition of the three women who got the award. So I had an exhibition in February, the following year, 2018 with two other women in Vienna. And then also someone who came to the exhibition and saw my work offered me to be in another group show in this castle outside of Vienna in the spring. So it was really nice. I went there three times for different events in this period and really amazing city and amazing cultural scene in Vienna. Okay. Early on, you talked about how like you did your Diana camera project that took two years, and you talked about another project that took three years. Like, How long do some of your projects take to do? Because it sounds like they're numerous years. Yeah, I think minimum two years. Like two, three years is probably most projects have taken that time, but some of them a little bit longer. But and then I might you know, get tired of myself of the project, so I, I can't drag it on too long. But it's mostly because my things are not set up. Like, it's like I have to find things. So let's say, I mean, I travel a lot and I find things and I'm inspired by the places where I travel. And then, uh, of course, I photograph a lot in Iceland, but also in other places. So like, like, for example, the equivocal book that I was talking about earlier, the first photograph in that series I made in a country house in Iceland and it was in the summertime. I was in this old house in this uh, dark room. And it was at midnight. And, you know, because we had the midnight sun, but the room was dark because there's a large tree blocking the window. So the room is very, like, dark. It had, like, this dark wood panel and, and you know, brown colors. And it's very, like, drab looking. But outside you had this, obviously, this maple tree that was lit up. I took this photograph and started when, you know, I had this kind of uh, desire to see more like that because I, it felt like there was this surreal world outside and I was staying inside in a to- completely different world. So that photograph, it triggered me to like look for other things, similar things. And that's why that book took so many years because I was looking for, I was also thinking about repetition and colors and textures, and, you know, things like that. So I had to like find things that worked and try different things. But it was mostly photographs from 
being outside and looking in or being inside and looking out through different threads and curtains and textures. So, yeah, that's why it took three years to photograph and then you know, edit and all that. Right. You, you brought it up the, about the women having issues of like family and children and responsibilities. Is this something that you uh, had an experiences with? Yeah. In a sense, if you decide to have children, it's always going to influence your career. But I have one daughter that my husband and I adopted in 2010. So I was 45 <laughs> when I adopted her. So prior to that, I had tried to have children for a long time and had some miscarriages and it took a lot of effort a lot of time and you know it took up a lot a large proportion of my life from 10 15 years of my life that you know process so of course it, it had an effect of on how much i worked at the time and so on but i think having a child when you're 45 is, is great because then she's now 12 so it's like i'm experiencing experiencing world i mean it's a different world when you're 12 now than when i was 12 so it's very interesting to to <laughs> have an opportunity to see you know things in her i mean this world of social media and online things and you know it's totally different indeed yeah what's your relationship with social media i you know i haven't been i mean the reason i started on facebook was because of my daughter's uh, soccer practice, there was all the communication was on Facebook. So I'm like, okay, I have to start, you know, I was never on Facebook before. And then a friend of mine who is an actress, she's like, well, you have to be on Instagram, you're a photographer. I mean, come on. So I started using Instagram pretty late also, but I like it better than Facebook. I spend more time on Instagram than Facebook. I like, you know, following artists, museums, galleries, you know, seeing what's going on. And then you, you can, if you're interested, you know, look it up. But, and then I don't post a lot of things, but, you know, mostly things that have to do with my own projects or exhibitions. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not a lover. Yeah, I'm not a lover of, of social media. I, to a certain extent, it's just the nature of doing business these days, basically. It's, it's your self-promotion. Yeah. I don't like it. I, the more I'm saying it, I'm like, no, I fucking hate it. <laughs> it just sucks up so much of your time and your and your your emotional energy too, because you're like, oh, I posted that. Do people like it? Are people liking it? Did I post it at the right time of day? Did anybody even see it? Like, fuck. Urgh. All that, yeah. There's all these theories, and I just don't think about it. I just do. I don't have many followers. I'm not a big, you know. But you know, I still do it, but it's not a big part of my daily life. <laughs> yeah. I try not to worry about it, but every now and then it sort of takes over my brain. So, all right. To wrap this up, I have two questions that I generally ask everybody. First question is, do you have three artists that you're paying attention to or looking at right now? Contemporary artists that you think other people should be also paying attention to? I mean, of course people should pay attention to Icelandic artists. I mean, there's a lot of interesting things. And since we are an island, isolated, <laughs> you know, in the middle of North Atlantic, it's difficult to get your stuff out there. Some specific names, though, some people. Yeah, specific names and people. I want to mention co-director of my collaborator on the Icelandic Photography Festival. His name is Pieter Thompson. And his work is about the man's impact on nature. The best known is series called Imported Landscape, where he documented the construction of a very controversial power plant that destroyed a large proportion of the highlands in Iceland. But it's pieterthompson.is. And then I have to mention an old friend who is a painter. Her name is Thordis Adelstein's daughter. And we met while we were living in New York in I think I met her in like in 99, and she was still then a student at School of Visual Arts in New York. And ever since, she's been such an inspiration to me because she works very hard and she never doubts. And she's always so focused and she never like doubts her art practice. So she's so consistent and it has paid off. She's very successful, of course, but she's humble. She's not on social media. She's not, you know, allowed in any. And so I think a lot of people just know about her for that reason. And 
she's opening, uh, in fact, in the fall, she's opening a solo exhibition at the Shoshana Wayne Gallery in LA. It's a well known, it was a big gallery. So if you, I mean, people can just look up the gallery website and see her work there. She, I just saw her yesterday. She was shipping off some work there to the gallery recently. So I think she's somebody. And then another artist would be a writer. She's my favorite writer. Her name is Adni Eir Ivarsdottir. And she is best known for her autobiographical novel called Land and Love and Ruins. And yeah, I particularly like her autobiographical. She has, I think, three or four autobiographical novels that are very intimate and personal. But at the same time, she has a background in philosophy, so it's always philosophical and also a social commentary. And she is also known for, I mean, she's known for being an environmental activist. And she's also known for her work with Björk, the Icelandic musician. They have collaborated on um, composing lyrics for Björk's uh, songs. And also, Otmi Eir uh, recently wrote text for one of uh, my exhibitions. We had a group exhibition at Björk Contemporary in the fall, and she wrote the text for that for this exhibition called Vegetation that I had with uh, two other artists at uh, Bar Contemporary. Oh, that's lovely. No. Okay, wait, you brought up text. I have a pet peeve about text. How do you feel about the need for artists to not only create work of art that's somehow interesting, well done, expressive, but also have to write text to accompany it? Mm -hmm. I mean, to write eloquently about it is something you can learn. And that's what we've been teaching students to do. And to an extent, everybody can learn to write about their work. Yeah, it's like you can learn it to a certain extent, but it's not like that you're going to be as good as a writer. And I don't think it's necessary either, but I think it's good to you know, be able to talk about it and write about it in some sense. I agree that the, some context is helpful, but I'm sort of more on the side of, all the texts that we have to write for grants and funding and residency and these kinds of things, you know, artist statement, they're kind of fun to do. And like they can give it, they can offer some additional context and sort of flesh out some ideas, but it's the fact that we then have to translate those into sort of standardized things that fit in 500 characters or 250 words or whatever that I find horribly painful. It is painful. I totally agree with you on that. And, you know, part of the job is to write all these grants and, you know, these applications. And we have in Iceland, we have this artist salary. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but every year I write an application hoping to get it the following year. And it's very hard to get because there's so many great artists and you're lucky to get it. But it helps in, you know, less teaching, more working on the art. So, I try to get it every single year. And then there's, a, if you don't get that, you need to apply for other things, like, you know, for books. So I, I'm currently working on a new book project. And, you know, I'm starting this process, you know, get, you know, filling out these things and writing statements. And of course, the more you do it, the more you mean you learn from that and you get better at it. But it's been like really difficult for me because I'm not a writer and it's been, yeah. It's taken a long time to figure out. I know. I just received my first substantial grant this year. So I was 47 years old before I got it. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, 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 you know, I went into the arts to try to be rebellious and sort of like be, a, you know, I, I didn't want to be in the corporate world. And now I'm in the corporate world, but the corporate, corporate world happens to be the arts world. So. You have to play the games whether you like it or not, sadly. Yeah. I mean, if you want to do this, you have to do what it takes. <laughs> and it's a privilege, I mean, being able to do this. It is. We are, we are incredibly, like, privilege is a great word for it. I say I use luxur luxurious lifestyle, <laughs> romantic lifestyle. <laughs> but, yeah, it is it is very much a privilege to even have the ability to not have to work what other job whatever other job that a lot of people in a lot of parts of the world are sort of necessary to work so yes first world problem for sure all right 
last question is uh, some advice for the next generation from your experiences. Something you wish you knew when you were young that nobody told you. I think stay at it. I mean, I think people are thinking too much about instant success or doing the exhibition or the project that's going to be successful. But <laughs> the thing is that I think, like I was explaining that my friend Thordis, who is the painter, kind of like her career, it's like she just does the work and she's passionate about her art. And that leads you to the next project. But you're not thinking about too much about like going to openings and, you know, hanging out with famous people because that's not going to get your art anywhere. But I mean, it's good to network and know people, but you need to have the work out there. I mean, you need to exhibit and work with your friends because it's, I think it's kind of a lonely. I struggled with that with when I graduated, but when you're not in the school community anymore, you're just on your own. And that's, you have to start things with your friends and, you know, hang out with people and, and, you know, do social things. I mean, like you can't just stay on your own working on your art, you know? Yeah. I think it's a lot about like stamina of, of lasting long enough. Indeed. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I hope you are enjoying and learning from the stories, experiences, and advice of our guests as much as I am. If you like the podcast, we would appreciate a five-star rating and a nice comment would be greatly appreciated. Please be sure to tell your friends to listen and subscribe as well. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We are produced by 5014. Audio editing is done by Jakub Czerny. And I am your host, Matthew Doles. For more information about the podcast and our guests, please visit our website, wisefoolpod.com. The Wise Fool is supported in part by an EEA grant from Iceland, Liechtenstein, and Norway in an effort to work together for a green, competitive, and inclusive Europe. We would also like to thank our partners, Hunt Kastner in Prague, Czech Republic, and Kunst Centrene i Norge in Norway. Links to EEA grants and our partner organizations are available in the show notes or on our website, wisefoolpod.com.